So let me now introduce you an alternative to what has been used in, in recent years. And this is deep filtering, which is based on uh, a framework that was developed in the 60s, which is deep neural networks, but it only achieved uh, the level of maturity because new hardware was developed in the last possibly 10 years. And these are GPUs. So deep neural networks are just like our brain. You have layers and you have weights, same weights as we have in the brain. And then when you expose the net to data, it starts learning patterns, basic patterns, and the deepest layers learn really abstract concepts. It is highly nonlinear, uh, and it has some really good features. Uh, the, the advantage of this is that in many of the things we, we tend to do with uh, time series is to extract information, like computing FFTs, and so on and so forth. With neural networks, you don't have to do that. You just input your noisy data, and it's going to do the analysis for you. And you may know that uh, the use of this is all over in the industry, right? Uh, Siri on your phone is a deep neural network. Self-driven cars, uh, web search tools, Google Translate, all, all of those are deep neural networks. Now, these are some advantages that I just mentioned. And some really cool features is that when you have a template bank of waveforms, it learns to interpolate. So you don't have to populate very densely a ring of parameter space because it has something like reduce order modeling inside of it. Now, let me just tell you, um, here I have advantages and features, but I should also have uh, something related to disadvantages. And one disadvantage is the perception that people have of artificial intelligence, in particular in the scientific community. Uh, they tend to see this as a black box uh, that is beyond your control. Far from true, uh, you can have direct uh, influence on how you are constructing the layers, how you place the neurons. All of that is under your control. Uh, it is a well-developed mathematical framework. Now, what are the advantages of this when you do, for example, uh, a comparison between match filtering and deep neural networks? So for match filtering, I'm only talking about correlation between templates. I'm not taking into account Fourier transform and all of that. This is just correlation. If you take the template bank I showed before for the binary black hole parameter space, and you process one second of data, LIGO data, using a CPU with a neural network, is 100 times faster just to do the correlation. If you use state-of-the-art GPU, this is about 5,000 5, times faster. And with some GPUs that we got from NVIDIA, this is now about 20,000. I'm going to change the slide every other week, so. This is uh, what is happening. Now, the, the beauty of this is that this means that you can, that you can do real-time analysis. And if you have information coming from LSST and from LIGO, you can send that to the same GPU and process that input. Uh, and obviously, if you have dedicated engine, engines for this, then you can increase the speed by about a factor of 100. Now, this is for classification. Now, what about parameter estimation? So most of the parameter estimation we do is using some hand-extracted features of the data. With deep neural networks, you can just input the data into uh, your GPU, and you can see that the error for prediction is about 10%, and these are all the other state-of-the-art parameter estimation techniques that we use. And when it comes to classification, you can see that all these are basically guessing, because it is 50% accuracy, yes or no. So it is outperforming all of these. So it is really good. Now, this is the part that I like the most. We train the neural network with quasi-circular non-spinning uh, templates. And just to test the robustness, we injected eccentric numerical relativity simulations, something that could be missed with existing algorithms in LIGO. And surprise, surprise, we were able to recover this with the same accuracy <coughs> with which we recover non-eccentric, non-spinning black holes. And we also injected the wildest spin processing eccentric simulations that the <coughs> XSS collaboration has in their catalog, and we were able to recover them and do parameter estimation. Now, in the last few months, we have now developed a new automatic framework to inject real LIGO data into the network. And this is beautiful because the network now is learning the glitch topology that you have in LIGO data, and also the properties of the PSD. And this is reinforced uh, 
training, it is called the link block. So this means that the neural network, in the future, when it sees some glitches, or it sees some non-stationarity in the PSD, it will know that something funny is happening, and it will tell you this is not a signal, this is a glitch. Don't worry about it. Now, let me move towards LSSD. <coughs> and this is another thing that we also created at NCSA, that is deep transfer learning. Now let me tell you about this. For LSSD, what we want to do is image classification, accurately and fast. Uh, sorry, there will be many classes of optical transients, and many of those we will not know them, which is cool. So let's start with a problem that is similar to LIGO and therefore close to home. So let me talk about detector characterization, which as you heard in the morning, is something critical for LIGO. If we do not understand the detector and the, the glitches, then we are in trouble. So glitches are non-Gaussian transient noise features. They describe a very deep parameter space. The duration, the frequency that they have, the topology is complicated. So when you have a problem that you don't, you don't know how to tackle, because the modeling is tough, but you want to have some predictive power and at the same time identify anomalies, these are the three key points for a machine learning problem. So it is begging you to use uh, machine learning or deep learning to do this. So uh, since this is critical for real-time uh, detector characterization, and this is one of the things that we are working on in LIGO related to real-time uh, data quality for uh, searches, then this is useful. So we have been working with uh, friends in Northwestern who are leading the Gravity Spy uh, project, which is a citizen science program, which consists of having glitches, and they ask humans to classify the glitches into different classes. And now the challenge is to go and expose the network to these different classes and see how well you can classify them. And these are the classes that you have in the Gravity Spy data set. And the good thing is that there is a class that is unknown. It is like a glitch, but we don't know what it is. But there may be a new glitch uh, in the future, because obviously LIGO is exploring uh, lower frequencies, so we will have new types of glitches, and they will go into the new category, which is pretty good. All right, so here you have two options. You can go and develop your neural network from scratch and use the images that you have in the Gravity Spy data set. But these are just thousands. You're going to run into overfitting meaning your accuracy for classification will be bad. If you go, for example, and grab Google Net, this was trained with over a million images and thousands of classes for these images, like dogs, cars, random images. And it is one of the state of the art neural networks in the market. And this is something great. Uh, corporations are now releasing the neural networks for free. You go grab them and you can do with them whatever you want. So we grab Google Net. And within five minutes, we were able to obtain 98% accuracy in classification, which means we throw the glitches and you get only a few errors in the recall, which is amazing. If you spend a couple more hours, then this grows. So this means that if we have, for example, for LSSD, some classes of electromagnetic tranches that we can detect, let's go grab one of these, you have an educated astronomer that tells you this image corresponds to this event. I expose the neural network to it, and when we're in LSSD time, we get millions of uh, images, we classify them in real time. So that is where we are moving forward. So this is now uh, something I want to mention because last week I was invited to the GPU uh, conference in San Jose, and there we learned about people who are doing this at the interface of high performance computing and artificial intelligence. And there is a research scientist in Outreach National Lab who's using the most powerful computer in the US to train neural networks. So what he's doing is, he has a problem, and then he says, okay, I have to determine these many hyperparameters, but I don't have all the time in the world to do it. I'm just going to submit 8,000 different neural networks using the 18,000 GPUs that you have in Titan and then you can have the best possible neural network in a few hours, which is amazing. Now, people in Blue Waters, uh, this is closer to my heart, they have really powerful codes based on GPUs, 
And there is a, a postdoc in our group that has a GPU-based code that can do AGN, and it is now moving forward doing compact envelope evolution. Uh, if you know about uh, cosmological simulations, Flash is like a powerful code to do this. But this code is 10 times up to 40 times faster than Flash. So you can do new physics with these codes. And what we're trying to do is to convince people that use uh, the clusters uh, very well, meaning they scale to tens of thousands of nodes, to rewrite the codes so that they can use GPUs. Now, um, we heard about people that now are using uh, deep learning to do these various problems. We started with uh, deep filtering, deep transfer learning, but people in Chile, for example, published a paper entitled Deep Hits, where they use deep learning to classify images from the DES dataset. In condensed matter physics, people using deep neural networks identify new states of matter. Galaxy Evolution, in the meeting, there was a, a professor from Santa Cruz that used one of the state-of-the-art GPUs to run a galactic merger in real time. And obviously, in cosmology, people using plum data are now uh, shifting through the data using deep neural networks. So one thing that was mentioned in this uh, conference is that uh, due to the emergence of new architectures, uh, the community, the computer science community, considered this time as the second revolution after Moore's law. Uh, because as I showed you before, the speed of HPC centers is not increasing. Our ability to process data is a thing that is increasing. Now, uh, moving forward, what this means is that uh, we need to take advantage of the situation, right? If you can adapt these algorithms to solve grand challenge problems, then you're going to have the beauty of a fast machine, like for example, Blue Water, Exceed, or Titan. You combine that with a framework to process petabytes of data in real time, and that's exactly what we want to do with gravitational waves and density data. Uh, now, one other thing that I mentioned before is that now corporations like Amazon, Google, and some others, they are releasing the neural networks, and it is sad that even in our scientific community, some people keep the codes for themselves. So they are now like spurting the change that we should have been doing for a long time, which is good for us, because then we can go and grab the neural networks and adapt them to tackle our problems. Um, so, this final slide is just to tell you that if you're an astronomer, you have an idea of what are the transients that we can see with LSST, and you want to partner with us, then the name of the game would be that uh, you give us your data sets with some meaningful labels, like for example, uh, after glow, this redshift, uh, this location in the sky. And then we can use these images to train a neural network to do uh, real-time classification. And this is going to solve some problems because if you depend on an event broker, you're losing time and you don't know whether the job is going to be done well when you can do it yourself, when you have your own neural network. And running the neural network does not require a state-of-the-art GPU. You can run it on your laptop. So in terms of uh, changing paradigms, this is now empowering people. All astronomers can do this in their laptops. Um, so if you go to this uh, YouTube thing, uh, you can see uh, a really nice video that summarizes what people are doing with artificial intelligence these days. So you can check this out later. Uh, and I finished. Thank you. Any questions? Rahul? So, when you talk about data, you're talking about single snapshots or time series of images? Uh, whichever. Both are good? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's actually related to my question. So if you, for your, let's say, gravitational wave, do you, you previously only had one detector channel. Are you incorporating multiple channels for multiple detectors? So uh, that's a really good point. Uh, I didn't touch on this. Uh, I don't know why. So what we are, what we have in mind is that intercontinental data transfer is a bit dangerous. Uh, and let me explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, we have control here in the US with high speed networks. We have gigapods, we have the platform in the Pacific. 
and you have good connectivity with uh, US and US and, US and Japan. Uh, but there are some issues, for example, in India, related to how you can disclose data. The other thing that you cannot guarantee is that the network is going to be reliable at all, at all times. If you lose a few milliseconds of data, you may have a gravitation of every signal. And instead of having multiple coincidences, you're going to have just a few with the detectors that are up and running. What we suggest to do is to have a dedicated GPU on each location. And then you can check for coincidence later on. Adding an additional neuron to do coincident detection, for example, at Caltech, if you're receiving the data stream from the five or four detectors, it's possible, it is trivial. You just add four or five neurons for the incoming data. That's not a problem. But what we suggest in terms of being practical and preventing uh, data dropouts is to have one GPU in each location. It is not too expensive. Sorry. Yeah, if Patrick was here, he would kill me. But there's, there's, there's an obvious flaw in that logic. Yeah, why? Well, if you want to do coincidence analysis, you have to transfer the results of the normal net from each site. To oh, central but I, I meant this for real-time analysis. Then you can do the offline analysis with all the uh, the different data sets. Do coincidence analysis in real time. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, but you can check for coincidence. If you have a trigger in one of the analyses, then but you can check for coincidence in the detectors. data. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Like, it's still data, right? Yeah. You only need to check, for example, you have a detection in one of your analysis running at Hanford. You have a, a trigger that says this is a signal. And at the same time, you have something similar in Livingstone and in Kashina. But that requires communication between the right, sites. Right. And that's the thing you're saying is not reliable. What I'm, what I'm saying is that you don't want to transfer the data. You can run the analysis at the site and then check for points. The trigger set is much larger than the data. The data is a trigger. megabyte a second. Trigger set is a gigabyte a second. I'm not worried about the volume of data that is being transferred. I'm just worried about being able to ensure that there will be no dropouts in the network. And there is no paradigm right now that can guarantee you that. Even in the US, the only possibility is zero and Q. And still, they, don't, they cannot guarantee you that they will not lose data in the transfer. But you also have that problem when you're doing coincidence. Like, you still have to transfer data, and there's no guarantee that you can do that perfectly. If the problem doesn't go away, you just make it a million times worse. I, I don't understand that. Okay, I think we can help with it. Yeah, sure. Okay. So to what extent are you using Google Nets off the shelf, and how much are you developing yourself? Um, so we took Google Nets, and you know it has more than 100 layers. Uh, we found that you can reduce that to about 50 layers, and it said mm -hmm. you can do a really good job. Mm -hmm. But you need to fine tune almost all layers. But it is a almost trivial task. Okay, so it's better for you to build on that than just doing it yourself. Um, so the problem with building the network yourself is that you have a limited uh, data set. And yes. just using a few uh, thousand images uh, would give you problems with overfitting. Okay. So you use the pre-trained tra uh, pre weights of the neural net and that's what is going to give you the edge to do good classification. So even with LCT, you don't expect the number of templates that can give you enough training data, do you? So you can use the pre-trained weights and now expose the network with the petabyte of data that you will have with the images, and that would be really good. Mm -hmm. Because I would say that the paradigm in the future could be that you would be feeding information constantly to the network, and it will learn about new classes, mm -hmm. And, though, and that means that in the future, when you find a new type of transient, it will know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Elio. Yeah.